Hi there, this is Dr. Coates. Um, I'm trying my uh, webcam again. We'll see how it goes. I'm planning on this this lecture being relatively short, so I'm hoping that that means there won't be any sync problems. Um, also, I just want to say one more time that you really ought to listen to my lecture from Tuesday before this one if you haven't already, uh, and definitely before you take the first exam. Um, so thank you. That, that's the one where I talk about form and prosody, and that's an extremely important lecture. Uh, today, this is the uh, second part of my how to read a poem primer. I'm going to be talking about diction and tone. Um, it's not going to be as terminology heavy as Tuesday's lecture. Uh, it is still something I think that you need to understand in order to talk sensibly about the specifics of poetry. Um, but these are, are two things that are best understood as holistic assessments of poetry um, involved with interpretation that has to happen after the fact rather than something that you keep track of while you're, while you're reading it in the same way that you might with content or form. So I hope it makes sense that I saved it for today's lecture rather than trying to cover it along with everything else on Tuesday. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is diction. And very simply, diction is the word choice within a text. The fact that some words were chosen to convey a given concept or image and others were not chosen. Uh, it's an easy concept to understand and to remember since it's re you know related very closely to that word dictionary, which I'm sure we've all accessed. Uh, but not necessarily all that easy to use to make a compelling point within an argument about poetry. On a basic level, uh, because poems are, are purposive artifacts, but by which I mean they didn't they don't happen by accident. You know, someone sits down to write a poem and then it, it happens because the, it was intended. Um, in that sense, every word of every poem is chosen, right? So when we talk about diction, what we're really talking about is the art of pinpointing words that stand out for us because they seem to have been chosen for a particular reason. And so you always need to specify not just that word choice happened, but which words were chosen and why you want to bring them up. Okay? You have to have a good idea when you talk about diction of what the poem was about before you start thinking about word choice. Uh, and thus, diction should probably not be the first thing that you focus on when you start to read the text. Before you do anything else, paraphrase the poem to yourself. You know, figure out who is speaking, when and where they're speaking from, what the situation is, what the action is, you know, if, if anything, why they are speaking, their motivation, and what they are saying and to whom. Uh, then take into account whether some of the language may be figurative and the extent to which the form and prosody of the poem are conditioning the content that you've just paraphrased, its ideas, its images, its rhetorical appeal, um, or giving you some sort of different idea about the speaker. For example, uh, in Siegfried Sassoon's poem, Repression of War Experience, which we talked about in the first week, um, the content of that poem alone can make us think that the speaker is going through a nervous breakdown while he is actually talking to us. It's like nervous breakdown in progress. However, the form of the poem gives the lie to that idea since the poem is mostly written in iambic pentameter, a stately sort of rhythm that indicates the poem has been revised many times and is not at all the raw record of an unstable mind. Thinking about diction is an avenue toward knowing more about your speaker, but not necessarily the only avenue or the best way. To stay with Sassoon for a moment longer, you might have noted that the speaker of this poem uses language that World War I British soldiers might have, expect, might have been expected to use. Jolly, glory, bloody, right? But then again, he also tells us that there's a war on in France and that he's summering safe at home, so he's on like a medical holiday. So even a fairly superficial reading can still get you in touch with the speaker and what they're all about. What diction allows you to do is to be more precise with the ways you're identifying the speaker and what makes him tick. Instead of describing, you know, in a um, sort of hand-wavy fashion, you can point to specific moments in the text. And then even if I, your reader, completely disagree with your characterization of the speaker, I will have to, I will have to come up with my own counter-explanations for why those words are present. So it's a good way to, of backing yourself up and making sure that you're able to point to the text so that you're, you're talking, you know, with real evidence behind you uh, and thinking critically about what's in front of you, rather than just making summary statements that you know I'm, I'm forced either to take or to leave based on you know my own. If you're if you're specific with it, I'll at least see where you're coming from, and I can reward you for what you do well. Having said that, there are going to be some poems that can only be interpreted well if you are paying close scrutiny to diction. So, for example, T.S. Eliot's poem Garantian, which is a dramatic monologue, is a great example of this phenomenon, something akin to slipping in a vital clue surreptitiously that, if you find it, will solve a mystery. That poem looks and sounds like this. And here, if you um, have trouble following me, it's, it's well worth your time to check out the transcript to see how this looks on the page. Um, here I'm quoting. Here I am, an old man in a dry month, 
being read to by a boy waiting for rain. I was neither at the hot gates, nor fought in the warm rain, nor knee-deep in the salt marsh, heaving a cutlass, bitten by flies, fought. My house is a decayed house, and the Jew squats on the window sill of the owner, spawned in some estaminet of Antwerp, blistered in Brussels, patched and peeled in London. The goat coughs at night in the field overhead, rocks, moss, stone crop, iron, mared. The woman keeps the kitchen, makes tea, sneezes at evening, poking the peevish gutter. I, an old man, a dull head among windy spaces. And it, it goes on from there for another 58 lines, but I'll spare you the rest. And to start talking to you about the diction of that poem. Now the title, Garantian, is a word that literally means old man or the aged in ancient Greek. Uh, but it also refers to one of the elders of Sparta, the Garantas, uh, who had to be pretty old to qualify for leadership uh, in that oligarchy. Um, so there is the possibility that the title's diction contains an ambiguity within it. Someone who is wheezy, dusty, and bitter, and who feels irrelevant because left out of life in favor of the young on the one hand, and on the other, a politician. If you consider hot gates in line three, in light of the Greek in the title, those of you who have seen the film 300, you remember This is Sparta? Yeah, although it's not said that dispassionately. Um, <laughs> you might be... Um, you might recognize that reference to the Battle of Thermopylae, which in Greek is literally hot gates, um, thermo, yeah. um, at which the 300 Spartans led by King Leonidas sacrificed themselves to save Greece from invasion. However, this old man did not sacrifice himself, and he seems not only to be bitter, but a raging anti-Semite. He doesn't even bother to capitalize Jew, as he reflexively hates on his landlord. And we're not in Greece, but in England during, during or just after World War I. This is a crucial thing to realize. Uh, you can account for the speaker's knowledge of Greek because wealthy young men of good class in England were not taught literature in school, but classics, uh, Greek, ancient Greek and Latin responsion. Um, but you can't account for his use of merd, which is French for poop, or more to the point, his knowledge of what an estaminet is, which is also French, uh, without World War I. An estaminet was a combination of a, taver a tavern and a brothel, so you could go and drink and also have sex, uh, which was frequented by British soldiers all of whom were stationed in the trenches in Belgium during World War I. Um, because Britain got into the war ostensibly because Belgium was invaded by Germany. Um, and because the Belgians speak French, and they had this, this sort of combination tavern brothel called an estaminet. Uh, it was frequented by many of those soldiers, and that's the only reason why Garantian knows that word. Okay, So unless you're attending... Oh, by the way, that also accounts for the references to Antwerp and Brussels, which are cities in Belgium. So unless you are attending to the word choice of this passage, you might drastically mistake the setting and time period of the text and miss the fact that it's making, at the time of its publication in 1920, extremely topical statements about the effects of the war and possibly criticizing the old, bitter, clueless politicians who sent so many young men to their deaths. What I just did there was to merge considerations of diction and tone, which is our literary critical term for any assessment of the extra-literal associations that are conjured by and then linger over the language of a poem. I think, again, most of us have an intuitive sense that the word choice of a text can prompt emotional re reactions within us, and that diction, like form and content, has some impact on the tone of a poem. If a poem repeatedly uses words that, when taken out of context, often strike you as sad, you might be tempted to declare that the speaker has a melancholy tone. But unless you verify that in the context of the content and the form, that melancholy is sponsored by the rest of the poem, you're basically falling into the trap of the affective fa fallacy, where you're importing, importing, sorry, where you are importing your own associations into a text that doesn't actually support those associations, right? After all, the, the voice of a poem might be ironic, or figurative, or ambiguous, or as in the case for Sassoon's repression of war experience, above the unstable diction and shaky syntax may be undermined uh, by the fact that the prosody is so very regular, right? So it's, you may think that he's going crazy, but on the other hand, the prosody is decidedly not crazy. Or, as is the case for Eliot's Garantian, perhaps the tone of the speaker is meant to be read as something distinct from the tone of the poem. In this case, that the speaker is a judgmental, bitter old man who may also be a mass murderer of innocence, and so we should be judging him rather than sympathizing with his feelings of exclusion. Right? So if you just look at the words and say, well, this is sad, he feels so bad, I do too, then you're failing to judge um, this murderous politician. Tone is holistic. 
You have to wait until you feel as though you've considered all the evidence in the poem before trying to make any pronounce pronouncements about it. To demonstrate this point, I'd like to turn again to Woodchucks, uh, which has that deeply ambiguous, uh, by Maxine Cuman that we read in, in week two, which has that deeply ambiguous first line, gassing the Woodchucks didn't turn out right. Uh, it didn't work. And at the same time, it was the morally wrong thing to do. But you wouldn't know that that, that, that line is ambiguous, that the speaker regrets her part in trying to, fill, to kill the family of critters until the end of the poem. When she compares the quick and painless gassing to her laborious, drawn out, and obsessive shooting, and decides that gassing is the quiet Nazi way of getting rid of vermin. Nazi, addiction, right? Nazi is a word that I never treat favorably <laughs> in real life. And indeed, inside the poem, too, I'm immediately troubled by her preference for gassing over shooting. So troubled, in fact, that we must conclude that she deeply regrets her role, her obsession, and how caught up she got in hunting the woodchucks. I understand your collective, your, your class's collective inclination to judge her pretty harshly because she calls herself a lapsed pacifist. Uh, many of you pointed that out. But of course, she is the one who's accusing herself of abandoning her principles. And she is laying bare her own humiliation, self-loathing, and hypocrisy. She knows that she's doing it. In general, we might say that at the very least, she is thoughtful about what happened. This is not somebody boasting about what she did and self-righteously showing off the bumper crop of chard that she harvested thanks to killing off the woodchucks. Um, so while it's troubling that she did what she did, those of us who garden know well how much it hurts to have your work destroyed by others, even if your livelihood does not depend on it. And I think even especially because your livelihood does not depend on it. Um, if, it's a, if you think of it as a small garden, say like 10 foot square, um, I actually feel like that, the, uh, that kind of gardener would be more likely to be provoked into this kind of response uh, than the owner of a large industrial farm you know, whose paycheck is depending on it. Um, because you're doing it as a hobby. Uh, because it's a labor of love rather than one of necessity, and you're probably doing it only on weekends or uh, evenings when you're exhausted from working all day, right? And then it's kind of like, well, this woodchuck, oh, I have to get rid of the woodchuck. Uh, but then all the more reason to feel guilty when your fun hobby devolves into a murderous ferocity. Okay, so say I gave you the poem Woodchucks on the exam and asked you to typify the tone of the speaker with the following multi-choice options. A, murderous. B, regretful. This is two, I guess. C, uh, self-righteous or D, innocent. I hope you would all agree after hearing me out that we can be conclusive about the tone of this poem, that it's not a free-for-all or, or up for grabs, and that D is not a good answer, because she does not feel innocent. A and C, although they are mentioned within the text, A and C were regretful and, and uh, self-righteous. Um, she says that she's self-righteously thrilling at, at one point. Um, whoops, I'm sorry. And not regretful. A is murderous, and C is self-righteous, right? And I did just talk about murdering the woodchucks. But those are emotions that the speaker inhabited in the recent past, rather than in the moment that this, the poem is being spoken, right? Because, so they are incorrect. They're not being felt within the lyric moment that the poem is creating for you. This is a retrospect. It starts off, gassing the woodchucks didn't work out right, Right? And so that means it's in the past. She's, she's telling you the story that happened you know, at least a few days ago. She's had some time to think about the incident and treat it in hindsight, hindsight. So B is the answer. She is regretful now. At the moment, in the moment when she's shooting, maybe she felt differently. But now, the moment from uh, within which the poem is being spoken to you, she regrets it. So that's all I'd like to say about diction and tone. Please now check out my screencast on Th uh, Thomas Hardy's Drummer Hodge. Uh, for more of an explanation for what, how to do things with diction in order to um, correctly assess the tone of a poem. Thank you.